The Director General of the Yahaya Bello Presidential Campaign Organization, Hassat Abiola Costello, has said that the Governor of Kogi State will, in a free and fair contest, defeat other perceived heavyweight in the forthcoming primaries of the All Progressive Congress, APC. She said the fact that he was independent and never accepted to have a godfather was a big plus for him, noting that the Nigerian people would be his godfathers once he becomes president. Abiola Costello said this on Sunday while addressing a world press conference in Abuja on the candidacy of Governor Bello, a top contender for the 2023 presidency. According to her, one of the major qualities is that this is a person that is willing to be independent, a person that is willing not to have a godfather. The people that will be the godfathers of Governor Yaya Bello when he becomes president are the people of Nigeria, she said. She, however, said, though it was clear that Bello had resisted the idea of godfathers for long, he would carry the older politicians along when he becomes the president of Nigeria. She said this in reaction to a question on whether he would emerge the winner of the APC ticket with the likes of Ashiwaju Bolatunubu, Vice President Yemi Oshibanjo, and other perceived heavyweight that put their heart in the ring. It is good that you said heavyweight, but he will win in a free and fair contest. His chances are actually the best for the group because in a competition, it is about the voters and 60% of Nigerians are under 30. I am his director general because I believe in him. There have been a grand stall in our country by young people to play a bigger role in our political affairs. You do not know about the not too young to run campaign that has been going on for a long time, which led to the president signing the not too young to run bill into law. Nigeria young people are ready to take more responsibilities in the governing of our affairs and this is the young people's candidate. But we really value and appreciate the heavyweight and those you called tested politicians. And they can be sure that if God willing, we have President Yaya Bello come 2023, he will carry them along. He will be consulting them and seeking their counsel. He will be wanting to build on their networks and resources because the country belongs to all of us. It belongs to the tested politicians and most especially the young people of Nigeria, the campaign DG said. On zoning, she said that the APC as of today had thrown open the contest, not restricting it to any zone, noting that everyone was eligible to contest regardless of the zone. At this time, the APC has said that all candidates are free to contest. They have given no restrictions by zone. We are guided by that. And our candidate has the freedom to put his candidacy forward. I can assure you that his candidacy that he has put forward has been done with a lot of consultations from within the party to the highest level. And there have been no reservations to his candidacy. The support across Nigeria is overwhelming, she noted. To um, inform you that His Excellency also holds the same opinion that we need to have a better structure to govern Nigeria. And that's why, if you look at what is happening in Kogi State, he has given autonomy. Well, the, the, fed, the country, the federal government has already granted autonomy to uh, local governments, but it's not practiced by all governors. Governor Yaya Bello practices it. The local government has autonomy. Um, they get their money directly from federal federation accounts to the local government. He pays a certain proportion of state revenues also to the local government, and he has worked to strengthen the institutions at that level. So, um, really, you cannot have develop the people are in those local governments. People are in communities. So we need a very strong local government administration system. We also need strong states, and as he has been, he is serving as a governor today, he well understands that. So this is a governor that, when he's in the role of presidency, he will be working to strengthen the states, but also to strengthen the local governments, because without strong local governments, it will be hard to, do, to, um, to deliver health care, to deliver education outcomes that are stellar. Now, to, sh to show you that his own efforts in just that one state has already begun to bear fruit, I want you to know that Kogi State has today one of the, is one of the top five states in Nigeria to drop under five mortality. It's also one of the states in Nigeria that um, the ASU um, strike doesn't affect the higher institutions because of the efforts the governor has put in place to make sure that the education, go, um, the students are able to go to school without any interruption. And he's done a lot of, as well to, um, Yes, in fact, my colleague, Mr. Okezie, was just reminding me 
of one of his major accomplishments. You know, out-of-school children in, um, is a major problem across Nigeria, but maybe especially in northern Nigeria. And I'm happy to tell you that through his efforts, Kogi State now has just 13% of the students out of school, where in some northern states it's as high as 50%. So it's on the basis of that is achievement, actually, that the World Bank removed Kogi State from the list of states of concern because they felt that his, his uh, performance has been so stellar. Um, so he has done a lot, and, but I want to also, Mr. Um, Oloko, talk to you about something you didn't mention, and I think it's very important because many Nigerians, when I talk about Kogi State, they mention this issue, and it's an opportunity to talk about that as well. I think it really goes to show that not only are we talking about a candidate that respects local government, we're talking about a candidate that respects workers, so, and many people seem to have the opposing view, maybe because they had um, misinformation fed to them for a long period of time, especially during the governor's first term. So I want to explain about the salaries, the issues of salaries and pensions of, of workers in the state. When the governor came on board in 2016, it was to find that the um, workers were actually on strike. The labor union, uh, the NLC of the state, were at called a strike because they were owed salaries. And he started to work on that issue right away because you cannot have a government without workers. Um, and one of the first things he did, what, one of the first things he observed was that Kogi State had failed to ride on the BVN that um, President Jonathan had been able to put in place to digitize the salary and the payroll of workers in his state. It, so he started to work on that. It took him almost 24 months. But since 2018, this is a governor that has not owed workers' salaries at the state level. One month. Not even for one month. Since 2018. Yes, since 2018. And, you, I, and I want you to even, I invite you to please try to um, really investigate because so many people will be saying the opposite things and it's lies. It's lies because the people, there were people that were, uh, there were whole schools um, that had teachers, principals, that when he started doing the verification exercise using the BVN, were discovered to be completely fake illusions. So there were people who, because of this exercise that he put in place, the verification exercise, we now found that there were people that were like vampires feeding the lifeblood of the state to themselves. And when he went and changed that system, of course he created enemies, and those people started feeding stories. And that's why I, I ask um, the media to please help because you can play a critical role in changing this, um, on this, um, this narration. It's, it's, it's false. It's actually that this is a governor that is trying to carefully husband the resources of the state to really benefit the people of the state. Now, in the past, you had small, powerful, connected people who were stealing much of the money of the state. You can't develop like that. No state, no country in the world can develop like that. And he, and he has put a change in that system. He also, when he came on board, met an IGR of 350 million Naira. He has built that IGR to over a billion Naira in the state. At local government level, there remains problems in terms of payment of full salaries. And I want to be upfront with you. As I explained, the federation, federal account goes directly, the proportion for local government goes directly to the local governments. And, and then of the IGR, a proportion also goes directly to local governments. But money that goes directly from the two sources are insufficient to meet um, the payroll of the workers. And they had the question that was considered was, do we retrench tens of thousands of workers? Well, we're in the middle of COVID-19, a global pandemic that has caused global economic dislocations, and especially on the African continent. It has caused such dislocations for Africa that about six countries in Africa have experienced military um, coups in the last two years. Indeed, I was just in um, Mali in um, April last year to receive an award from the Bamako Forum. And as I left Mali, it was the same day I left, a coup was launched by the military, um, the soldiers of Mali. So we know that this economic crisis is having social and political impacts on the countries of Africa, but even here in Nigeria. And I want to even suggest that the states that have been so harsh 
in the retrenchment of workers is also linked to those same states that have seen a rise in kidnapping and crime and social um, concerns. So when the issue came to Kogi State, do we retrench these workers since we do not have the money to pay? The, the labor union of Kogi State advised the governor not to retrench, and then they committed that whatever money comes in, that the National Union of Teachers and the National Union of Labor, um, labor local government okay. employees, Norge, with the local government councils would sit together and agree how to proportion the money so that everybody will at least take something home. And that is what they have done. And frankly, as an African, I understand this because Africans, we share. We look out for each other. And that's what they've tried to do in Kogi State. So you will find that at local government level, the salaries are not being paid at 100%. It's because the resources are not there. But the salaries are being paid to the optimum that can be paid and has been agreed by the local governments themselves. So they understand. And, it, and I think it's one of the reasons why Kogi State today is one of the most secure states in Nigeria. It's one of the, yes, the governor has also done other things to beef up the security architecture of the state in terms of policing, even to the ward level. But I think if you had violated the rights and, um, of people to the degree that you would force them out of work in an economy that is not generating enough jobs, the people would have reacted in an adverse manner. So this shows a governor that has the people's interests at heart, a governor that thinks with, a human, with human feeling which is exactly the kind of leadership we need also at the federal level. So then the next question came from Mr. Akonde from TBC. And he asked about the hope mantra that how do we see, Mr. Akonde, is, you were asking about hope, yes? Yes, hope 93. I was asking you were asking me how much I was involved at that yes, time and, how, you bring that and how we bring that to there today. Now to say honestly how much I was involved at that time, I was not very involved. I was, um, in 93, I was, um, this was, I was maybe a junior at Harvard University studying economics. The, the extent of my involvement really was that my father had said that um, when he came to see me, in fact, he came to see me after the annulment and he came to meet my teachers, which was a blessing. I was really, I'm really blessed to have had the father I had. Can I continue? Go ahead, go ahead. So, um, Oh, and, uh, to our school. It's only one of the best schools in the world, if not the very best. So, of course, you would send me there, especially if I could get in, right? But I think, you know, at Harvard, the, this was the question they asked him. And my father responded, he said, he sent me there to learn what the countries that are rich know. Um, and to be honest with you, I felt so sad when I heard that answer. Because by the time my father came to visit me at school, I was already in my junior year, which meant that I only had maybe 18 months to two years left of school. And I had not been studying just what my father just said. I had not been studying that. I had actually worked with my professors to create something called a special concentration, which is possible for students at Harvard. Um, and that special concentration was to study Africa, Middle East, Asia, Eastern Europe, what we call the developing world. I wanted to understand the developing world. So, and my father had just come to say that he wanted me to understand the developed world. So I, was, I felt traumatized because I felt that I had been wasting his money. I had not been doing what he wanted. Because I'm that kind of daughter, that kind of child, that if I know that this is what my family, my father and my mother want, this is what I will do. So, um, so I started trying to change that. And I was lucky because after I got married, I went to China and I was able to go to Tsinghua, which is also their number one university. And I studied their public administration. And I focused on just that issue that my father had said, to try to study what these countries knew. Especially, I was trying to study how China was developing. Because you know, China's development is incredible, but it's also recent. So there's a lot that you can learn. On, um, you know, you blink, and China has done something new. So I can learn on the go. So how does this connect with HOPE 20, M23 and even HOPE 9, M93? You know, when I looked and I've been, so, I've, so essentially what I'm saying to you is that for the last 20, 30 years, my whole obsession is to understand why African countries are doing badly and how African countries can do well. And in all of that time, some of the things I learned, um, you will see um, 
it's really about providing opportunity. And, ex and it's almost as if um, the governor himself has been doing a deep study because his whole platform in HOPE 23, the three pillars of his platform, security, unity, and prosperity, or if you like, progress, because it's progress through prosperity, is very much in line with all that I've been studying in the last um, 30 years. I want to take each one at a time. Security, if we're spending a lot of our resources, which is what we're doing now, on defense, it can, it's understandable because we're dealing with a very insecure situation in our country. And without security, we cannot even begin to talk about development. Security is actually a precondition for development. So it's number one pillar for His Excellency Governor Yaya Bello. Unity. Yes, we can say that um, Governor um, President Buhari has done so much in terms of infrastructure. And, but we think, you know, but, but unfortunately, it's not, many people feel that he's not, he has not carried every group along. And I think it's just because of the way he speaks. Sometimes he speaks so bluntly, you know, when he said 95%, 5% and all of this. To me, this is a precedent that is concerned about all Nigerians, but it, it did not always come across. Pros governor Yaya Bello understands the importance of symbolic gestures. We're speaking of a governor that when he was in Kogi State, he built a church in the state um, um, premises before he even built, in the government house, before he built a mosque. So that, and this is not a Christian, but he understood that the Christians, especially the Christians, because he is not a Christian, the Christians need to know that they are recognized and that they belong, and that he respects them, he values their presence there. And he needed to also let them know that they should be comfortable there. And he knows, you know, we, Nigerians are religious people. So once they have their religious house there, the Christians will be so happy. And he did that, you know. This is also a president that, a governor that has done so much in terms of making sure that his own state is secure. As I said before, it's now the most secure in the country. It's not an accident. You know, that state, if you think about security, it should be one of the most insecure because it borders many other states. So people come in, are coming in from every direction. But he has put in place an architecture that has allowed them to monitor movement and also to, to, um, to show an alert whenever there's something they should be aware of so that they can protect the people of that state. And it's on the foundation of that that is pro promoting the economy in the state, promoting the unity of the different ethnic groups in that state. And it's what he hopes to be able to replicate at the national level. I think one big thing that we will see at the national level from his efforts on security is that it will be very much involved in the day-to-day -day operations. It will be looking for week, um, daily reports from the security officers. It may even be going to um, key um, po um, points to engage. There was a time that somebody was kidnapped in the state, um, one of the a retired civil servant. If, if the operation was going on, the, it was being videoed and it was following, it was making sure that, in, um, that the rescue would be done as it should be done. And that's what we can expect from him. So you'll be very dynamic, which is the value of his youthfulness. He has the energy, and he's going to deploy, deploy it to solve our most pressing issues. We look at the issue of unity, and I mentioned earlier about his efforts to make sure of the configuration of his team. And we will see that as well at federal level, so that no matter where Nigerians are from, Nigerians will know that they have a stake in the government, that they are part of the government. Because at every level, it's not that any group will control one area. Every group of Nigerians will be in every area of the government. And you will see this, and it will create a sense of unity. Prosperity, and I think for me, from all the studying that I've done, is possibly the most important thing. And I think, you know, for this, I am so excited about the fact that he's speaking about prosperity, whereas in 93, we spoke about farewell to poverty. Why the di <laughs> distinction? I think that the best, what we have learned in that in the 30 years that has transpired since um, my wonderful, brilliant father spoke about farewell to poverty, is that the best way to say farewell to poverty is to provide opportunity for prosperity. And we've, we've seen that with China. That's what China has done. We've seen that with India, the rise of India. And I think, you know, I'm sure you all agree with me that if the miracle of the um, 20th century was the rise of India and China, especially China. 
the rise of the 21st century has to be the rise of Nigeria. And now we have the opportunity early in the 21st century to put in place a young dynamic leader with the wherewithal to begin to put our resources, both human and financial, together in such a way that we, we all move together as one nation to really deliver on the promise and the hope. Yes, people died to bring about this democracy, but the best gift we can give to those people is to show them that they did not die in vain. The promise that MKO made and the promise for which many Nigerians gave their lives for the June 12 struggle was that the Nigerian people would say farewell to poverty. And I want to close my remarks by saying to you yet again that this candidate, Governor Yaya Bello, is he has the qualities to harness the brilliance of our people, the energy and dynamism of our people, the ebullience of our people to deliver on that promise. Thank you. General of the Yaya Bello Presidential Campaign Organization. Um, I've been introduced already, but again, my name is Hafsa Tabiola Costello. Um, I'm the first female director general of a presidential campaign for a leading candidate in Nigeria. And this breakthrough is one of the many reasons that I am here today to speak on behalf of this um, leading Nigerian. Many of you um, may know my background. Um, I was maybe 22 years old the first time that I addressed the media. It was the day after my mother had been gone down in Nigeria. It was the 5th of June in 1996. The media I spoke to was the CNN in Washington, D.C. And I spoke to them then about a commitment that I, I was going to take up to my mother's cause, which was that Nigeria would have democracy. And, and th at that time, we thought it would be through um, the res restoration of the mandate freely and fairly given to my father, Moshud Kashima Wolawale Abiola, in 1993. But um, the events that unfolded um, shaped differently. And we came to 1999, MKO Abiola himself also had died. And we began this democratic experiment that both parents and many other important Nigerians, and even when I say important, I also include many young students who marched and were gone down and so many other people whose names are not remembered today paid their lives for us to have that beginning. And I have to tell you, and I don't know how you feel, but I have been deeply saddened over the decades by what I saw happening in my country. Before my father ran for office in 1993, there was one night he came into my bedroom he always used to travel all over the world. You all know this, I'm sure, that those of you who, can, who were old enough to know him. He was an international businessman, and he used to travel a lot. And if you were trying to see his children in the hours when they were awake, because of his schedule, it might be that he wouldn't see his children at all. So this time he came into my bedroom, it was around 1 AM. And he, um, he sat um, um, at the tip of my bed, and I remember waking up looking at him, seeing that he was there. And, and I said, Daddy, why do you look so sad? And he told me, he said, half sad. You know, actually in our home, they call me Bamayo running. So he called me Bamayo running, won't care. He said he, was, he used to go around and that now he sees children eating out of garbage cans. This was maybe 1991 when he said that. And he found it, it, was, it was deeply troubling to him Ladies and gentlemen, the poverty that my father saw then is even deeper today. I know that under this current administration, we've been able to bring 20 million people out of poverty because Nigeria, as you remember, was the poverty capital of the world with about 87 million in poverty. And in, now we no longer have that um, title, that um, disgraceful title 
because we've been able to move 27 million under in the last um, seven years under this current administration. But that number, 70 million that remain poor today, is way more than what MK was traumatized by in 1991. So it can't, you can't help but wonder that can we not do this better? And I really feel that this candidate that I'm representing, Governor Yaya Bello, is the candidate that can. Um, I'm looking forward to your questions where you, we can discuss and um, together why I think this. But when I look at him, Governor Yaya Bello, I see something that I saw also with uh, my father, which is that he's a unifier. He believes in Nigeria. We need a Nigerian leader that believes in Nigerians, that believes in all Nigerian people, and will fight for all Nigerian people. MKO was such a man. This governor, Yaya Bello, is also such a person. In his own cabinet in Kogi State, all six geopolitical zones are represented, all six. And this is somebody that fights for young people. You know, we now have Boko Haram, and we know from the history of Boko Haram, we know that some of, what, um, some of the young people that became members of Boko Haram had actually been used by politicians in preparing for elections and then dumped afterwards with no opportunity. And then when you combine that with the general injustice that they experienced every day in their lives, you could see that they, there was an explosion. They had had enough. And they now turn to this violence that the whole country is suffering from today. Even the kidnapping that we see um, in many parts of Nigeria is also a signal because of the lack of opportunity in the country. This person that I'm representing today, Governor Yaya Bello, fights for young people. His government has 95% of the appointees are young people. He doesn't just use them to campaign. He puts them in his structures with opportunities to have dignified work. Even look at his campaign council. Look at all of us that are here, members of his campaign council. You should see that we're not old people. Indeed, many people said to him that for your director general, you can have somebody much older that has more experience. And he fought to be able to have somebody, to have me serve in this role even though I'm younger than the people that were being considered, even though I am female. You also recall that his um, ADC is female. I want to mention these breakthrough appointments for women. Why? Because since I was appointed as his director general, I've been getting messages from other um, aspirants saying that I could have come to do that, play that role for them. The truth is they, were, they never asked. And they even probably never considered asking because they had never considered a woman in that role. But this is a leader that breaks, it doesn't, when he thinks of capacity, he doesn't think only men have capacity because it's not true, not only men have capacity. When, when my father was in jail, we should remember that Kudra Tabiola, my mother, was the one that financed Nadeko. She was the one that organized the oil workers union strike. She was the one that led demonstrations it was because she was so important in that role. And when um, Frank, um, Frank Dabibi and Mil um, um, Kokori, Frank Kokori and Milton Dabibi were arrested, and it was discovered that it was my mother that was helping finance the oil workers union strike, it was the reason why she was gone down. So we know that women have played an important role for us to have the democracy we enjoy today. Is it wrong to give women as many opportunities within that democracy as possible? It is not. Indeed, it is even good for the country to do that. And he's such a leader that does that, whatever the consequences. So I would like us to really, I know that there are a lot of controversial misinformation out there about my candidate. And I look forward to your questions so I can clarify these. I would not support this man if I do not truly believe that after my father died and that promise that he had made to the people of Nigeria was left unfulfilled, I would not support him in the way that I am supporting him today if I do not believe that he's the person that can help us fulfill that promise. And he has signaled that intention in a very clear and compelling way by saying that <clears throat> MK Abiola spoke for hope 1993, OPE 93, and he has said that he will adapt that um, platform, HOPE, 
but for 2023, for the modern time that we are in, which is actually even more challenging, in many ways more daunting. But the Nigerian people that are here, all of us, not just in this room, but in this country, once we are with the leader that unifies us, who sees our competencies and will use us in the different roles based on our competencies, not based on our um, ethnicity, then we know that all these problems that we say Nigeria has are problems that we will solve one after the other. This country will be a, a story of wonder, not just for our country, not just for our continent, even not just for the black people of this world, but for the whole world, that they will see that these black people that people think are inferior are at least as equal as everybody else in the world. And Nigeria will show them this in a very compelling way. Thank you very much. Things that I was able to draw out of that, and that I'm very sure my wonderful colleagues here have also. He is young and he speaks for the years. That means he cherishes inclusion. Introduce um, another member of the Presidential Campaign Council. Yes. Um, I think that Nigerian young people are ready to take more, more responsibility in the governing of our affairs, and this is the young people's um, candidate. So actually, I think that um, he's riding a tide and is part of a movement of young people saying that they're ready to take responsibility. And we really value and appreciate the tested politicians, and they can be sure that um, if God um, willing, um, pres we have President Yaya Belo come 2023, he will be consulting them and seeking their counsel. Um, he will be wanting to build on their networks and resources because the country belongs to all of us. It belongs to them, these tested politicians, but it also especially belongs to the young people of Nigeria. So he will be able to bring, he will be able to uni unite the country, the tested politicians and the younger people, um, and bring us in one channel, driving in one direction. Instead of, you know, I, I saw what that one politician assured, um, one tested politician who is much older, assured Nigerians that he would hand over, if elected in 2023, he would hand over to a young person in the subsequent election. My question is, why can't we hand over now? We already have an excellent, capable administrator who is also tested, but who is also young, and he has stepped forward. So we should give him a chance, and all the tested politicians in the interest of the country should rally around him. Now, um, your second question was from Mr. Benjamin. Thank you. Um, Mr. Benjamin, or oh, Miss, ben Miss Benjamin, Puran 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 Puranian. Punarinan. Punarinan. I've learned a new name today, Punari Man, Punari. It's a lovely name. Um, why, given the fact that my brother is also contesting, um, am I I'm leading this campaign? I'm leading this campaign because I believe in the candidates. Um, I'm happy that my brother is contesting. I'm happy that we have many excellent um, politicians contesting. I think it's good for Nigeria's democracy, and I look forward to these politicians discussing and debating policy ideas so that you know the best team that wins will have the strongest um, body collection of policies to run with in serving our people. Um, so I look forward to listening to the ideas that uh, my brother, Brother Kola, will put forward I don't think he's running. He says he's going to be doing some consultation within the PRP. But, I, but whatever the case is, I think that Nigerian people deserve to listen, to hear from Governor Yaya Bello. I think he's exceptional. He has certain qualities that, even beyond anything that I've said today, I, I, one of the major qualities that I see is that this is a person that is willing to be independent. This is somebody that is willing not to have a godfather not to be beholden to other interests. The godfather that will be, the people that will be the godfathers of Governor Yaya Bello, inshallah, when he's president of Nigeria, is the people of Nigeria. There will be his godfathers and godmothers. And it is about time we have that. You know, I'm pretty much, um, and he's also a fighter. He's ready to fight on behalf of our people against vested interests. 
Um, these are exceptional qualities because I've been, as you know, I've been involved in this since 1993. And so I've seen all of the politicians and I can still say with every confidence that this candidate is exceptional and is worthy of your attention. I want you to, with an open mind, consider him, consider what he has to say, consider how he interacts and compare him to the other candidates. I, sh I really do not think you will find him lacking in any way. And for me, the lesson I learned from Chief Abiola, my father, was that Nigeria is bigger than my family. It's not about my family. It's about this great nation, without which, without the rise of this nation, the whole continent is forfeit. The whole continent has 1.3 billion people. Do we want to make them forfeit because my brother has entered a competition? No, I, I will not do that. And I do not think my father would expect that of me. What I owe my father is what I continue to do, which is to try to honor his promise to the Nigerian people that they will say farewell to poverty. And to my mind, this candidate is the one that can help us do that. I think that Mr. Sadiq Omolayo, Omolaoye, Laoye, he asked the question that there's an unwritten rule that North Central has, um, because the North Central as the APC chairman, that how can we then also present, um, can we also have a precedent from the same zone? At this time, the APC has said that all candidates are free to contest. They've given no restrictions by zone, and so we're guided by that. And our, our candidate has the freedom to put his candidacy forward. I can assure you that his candidacy that he has put forward has been done with a lot of consultation from within the party to the highest levels. And there's been no, um, there's been no reservation to, what, to his candidacy. So we are confident that within the party he has the freedom to put his candidacy forward. There was a second question that said um, from um, that, why is he not campaigning? But he is campaigning across the country. Indeed, it is on the strength of his campaigning across the country well before this year that allowed us to gather in the way that we did for his declaration. And you saw that Nigerians came from north, south, east, and west to be there with him for his declaration. You cannot have that if you, if you don't have um, ground, you don't have people on the ground. Even yesterday, as I was leaving the campaign secretariat, it was to find the, um, the team that had come from Zamfara to, to meet with us. That's part of our, one of the support groups that we have. But we have the support groups. In fact, in states, our problem now is that we have so many, and we're trying to now harmonize them so that they can work together. But this is a people's movement. This is a candidate that wants to, that he understands that his power is from the people, He's not afraid of our people. He wants to be engaged. He has been engaging with our people. And, and I think that as, because for the first um, obstacle is the primaries, for which it's only a contest um, that is decided by delegates. And so after that, you will then see the nature of the groundswell and consultation that he has been doing nationwide. You will see the evidence of that. If, as we pray, will happen, he wins the primary election.